pleasure to speak at CEP again. Um, and it's a special pleasure to, you know, uh, come after this really interesting, um, you know, preparing the ground, both from Johans and also from Ambassador Fitton Brown. Um, so I can dive right in into, into my perspective, um, which will be, as Hans mentioned, um, you know, a perspective on, on both the potential of foreign fighters traveling to Afghanistan, um, you know, what we have learned from those that have traveled to join jihadist organizations in Syria and Iraq, and especially the perspective of those that have returned or potentially return mostly to, to Western, Euro uh, Western European countries um, in, in the near future. Um, so I think um, it, it's uh, still it's still interesting to start with, um, you know, asking the question is, um, is there is there really a, a good moment um, to travel to Afghanistan as a foreign fighter right now? Um, Ambassador Fitton Brown has already mentioned um, several very important factors, so I will try to make this really quickly. Um, but I think it's still it's still interesting to mention that, of course, Afghanistan has been historically a very attractive destination for foreign fighters. It has a long tradition, um, so it's not like a new a new destination or something that um, you know people would still have to get their head around. Um, and uh, as the UN monitoring team, coordinated by Ambassador Fitton Brown, has has mentioned in the report in June 2021, 20, uh, is that there are still. Um, around 20,000, um, sorry, 10,000 foreign fighters still um, present in Afghanistan. So this is quite significant still, um, mostly from Central Asia, uh, the North Caucasus region in uh, Russian Federation, Pakistan, and also a uh, region of China, um, mostly Taliban, um, but also for other groups. And as you mentioned already, um, it's estimated that um, ISK members are around um, 2,000 um, currently. So this is the, the picture I think um, interesting or um, important to keep in mind. Um, and then again, he mentioned this already, is that I also do think that this, this Taliban victory, the takeover, the now presentation as a government, as a state, um, is really um, perceived as a morale boost. Um, it was really also perceived as a moral victory. Um, and that um, interestingly also as a as a um, you know perception that yes violence can work very well so um, the perception that um, demanding for political change um, non-violently such as for example Muslim Brotherhood has done um, um, might not be the best um, way so it has given a boost to this perception of yes we can um, throw out uh, Western powers and we can really uh, build a build a state um, and also the focus of um, jihad on, on the local level. So liberating and, and focusing on, on, a, on a state um, as opposed to uh, tar targeting the whole international and global and, and, and uh, jihadi community all over the world um, might not be the West way, uh, as some observers have pointed out. Um, also, um, I, would, I would say that slightly, um, you know, in, in the chatter, ISK has been uh, perceived as more welcoming to potential foreign, foreign fighters. Um, allegedly, Taliban has sent a message that they were not ready to support cross-border movements. Um, again, Ambassador Fitton Brown has pointed out that um, they are in a diff different place right now. They um, are currently interested in also having a, a better international reputation, um, establishing themselves as a, uh, you know, also as a, as a partner in some sorts. So now having um, a large number of um, foreign fighters pouring into the country might not be in their best interest, whereas ISK is, is obviously in a different um, position. Um, also, the recent um, attack that has been mentioned in the Kabul airport, of course, gave ISK a huge visibility. Um, so this re was really something very important for them um, that they succeeded with you know, this gruesome attack. But from this perspective, of course, as mentioned already, um, it really you know, helps um, uh, raise their stake, um, for example, also attracting um, and, and recruiting disenfranchised uh, Taliban that are not happy with the with the Taliban uh, Taliban's approach, not radical enough, for example. Um, and also, there has been, um, for example, reports of Southeast um, Asian government officials saying that all the chatter that they intercept is really 100% about how do we get to Afghanistan. So there's really, as mentioned already, there's really a, a movement, there's really a, an interest in how do we get there. Uh, how can we do this? Um, but um, uh, also here, I would point out that the, the focus seems to be on ISK again uh, as the potential destination. But I would also, uh, you know, um, I would also say that um, it's very early. Um, and I think, yes, um, many would um, observe first and um, before deciding which, which kind of faction to actually integrate. Um, and then, of course, I think 
Um, but there is uh, um, another factor to take into consideration that there is also a confrustration with the situation in Syria and Iraq. There has been the, the, at least the military defeat of, um, of the whole uh, IS uh, caliphate. Um, so this is also that um, um, plays into the, 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 the push factor um, that um, might push uh, foreign fighters from this region into another region and in this, uh, in this context, Afghanistan. Um, and um, also, I think important to point out that the root causes that that um, motivate foreign fighters all around the world to consider leaving the countries and joining jihadist group um, in other countries are still there. These kind of situations have not changed. On the contrary, you might even point out that um, there has been more crackdown, uh, more international CT cooperation, more persecution, um, and maybe even more uh, stigmatization and, and discrimination towards uh, Muslim communities because of the whole IS uh, reports um, of their violence, for example. So I think this is um, this is imp important to keep in mind. Um, and then, if you look at who would be who would be potential foreign fighter groups, and I think it's it's interesting to maybe name three. Um, um, again, um, um, we we have heard that um, the. The ISK um, has reportedly said that they are looking for educated individuals, they are looking for highly experienced foreign fighters, so they don't seem to target the, the larger community, but look to really strengthen their, their, their force in a, in a, a quality over quantity matter. Um, and um, so uh, I think uh, first group would be those uh, foreign fighters already in Syria and Iraq that are now interested in relocation. Um, for example, uh, a foreign uh, jihadi leader in, in Syria has said that um, many of our brothers will go to Afghanistan, which has become a safe haven now. So um, they feel oppressed, for example, by Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. So one option would be, OK, let's leave this behind and let's start something uh, else in, in Afghanistan. Um, another group um, that um, might be a potential foreign fighter group um, are those uh, that are geographically close. Again, this has been mentioned already. So, for example, Central Asia, but also um, or Ch China. And um, also Tanya Mera from ICCT has mentioned that there's a real threat of an exodus of hardened fighters from Kyrgyzstan, from Tajikistan, that are also more likely to go uh, to, go to Afghanistan. Um, and then finally, um, we also have existing networks in, in, in other countries. So, for example, um, Australian government has said that they know of some individuals that have allegedly supported ISK in the past and that, you know, some of them have um, expressed the intention to also uh, travel uh, to Afghanistan to join them. And um, second example is also Germany, actually. Um, you see this in the picture. Um, as was a police raid uh, on on uh, on a uh, on a community center in in, in Germany, and uh, currently there are uh, several individuals uh, from ta from Tajikistan who have been living in Germany, and um, they have you know they are now prosecuted for um, planning an attack, planning assassination, terrorism financing, and they have been in contact with high-ranking IS officials in Afghanistan and in Syria. So I think it's really important to watch. Um, what kind of connections exist also between um, groups in Afghanistan and, and potential German networks, for example. And then next up, um, I think it's it's also worth um, looking back into um, the, you know, the, the foreign fighters that had traveled to Syria and Iraq, um, which is now, you know, almost a decade, let's say. And I think we have really, um, we have really come a long way um, First of all, um, when when the Islamic State was rising, of course, there was more of attraction of male foreign fighters uh, joining them. But as they proceeded into really a, a state building organization uh, of, of, of different um, needs also for different roles of people, they attracted also women and um, even uh, welcomed minors. So Joanna Cook and Gina Vale, previously at ICSR, estimated that all foreign IS affiliates are 50,000 people. Of those uh, women, 7,000 people, uh, 7,000, excuse me, and minus uh, 6,000. Of course, some of them have deceased already. So it's, you know, an estimate, but it just gives you the impression that um, when this started, we were not prepared for this kind of um, group of people and of diverse people traveling uh, to an Islamic state and to join this kind of jihadist movement. So I think that now, hopefully, we will not again underestimate um, these kind of movements and also the the extent um, of roles, but also the extent of numbers that you know might be attracted to 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 this kind of endeavor. Um, 
Then um, another issue was that um, we know that some of the foreign fighters were not known to security services. So of course, it's incredibly difficult to prevent travel of, uh, let's say, a German national who is traveling to Poland and then to Hungary, and then ends up in Waziristan in Pakistan, or of a German nat national uh, traveling to, uh, to Turkey and then crossing over to Syria, if you know, he might be going to vacation. So um, this is really a challenge that we, that we uh, at the time, um, I think, underestimated um, these kind of travel movements, but that now we have a much better understanding how people travel, uh, where are networks, uh, where are uh, important points of, of contact and so on. So also, I think this is where a, a step ahead um, now. Um, and then also um, interesting is that at a time there were, I think there was a, um, it was more difficult to, to actually um, bring them to prosecution or press charges. So for example, meanwhile, um, you know, having foreign fighters also from Europe, but also from other countries traveling, um, we now have different on a national and international uh, level laws that, for example, criminalize the traveling to a certain territory. Um, the, the stay in a certain territory, for example, it can also be prosecuted, as well as, um, for example, perceiving um, joining a non-state armed group can be perceived the same as joining a, a, a different uh, army of another country. So, for example, now um, uh, Germany has a law that can strip citizenship uh, of foreign fighters that might travel to a non-state uh, armed group. Whereas in retrospect, this cannot be applied to foreign fighters uh, that have gone to Syria and Iraq. So again, we have a different uh, legal situation, if you so will, because we have learned from these mistakes that at that time we were not prepared uh, in, in a legal perspective. Um, and also, I think um, at the time, there were some voices saying, well, it's great that they are gone, you know, go ahead, uh, you do your jihad somewhere else. Um, it's good that these people are no longer in our, in, our, in our territory. Whereas now I think we have a much better understanding that the, the, the person that might uh, join a jihadist group um, abroad might come back, might be sent back. Uh, you know, there might be social issues, a family member who's sick or so on that, that brings the person back. So even if somebody has decided to leave everything behind, that doesn't mean that it doesn't necessarily mean that it will never come back. So really observing different movements um, back and forth, I think this is also something that we have learned uh, from, from this whole foreign fighter uh, uh, issue uh, traveling to Syria and Iraq. Um, and then um, quickly on the, on the challenges that we're now first facing with returning foreign fighters, or those, those that you know, already returned, might return in the future. Of course, um, also Ambassador Fitton Brown has mentioned this, uh, there are really different national uh, approaches to repatriation of those that are now uh, in, in the northeastern uh, Syria and camps are also detained. Um, most are very reluctant to repatriation um, and uh, some have, you know, actively removed citizenship like uh, the UK or also Australia. Um, but now there are more and more countries that um, happily, I, I would say, or luckily uh, are more, uh, you know, more willing to repatriate at least minors. Um, so there are a number of countries like uh, also Germany, Finland, uh, but also Italy, Denmark, the Netherlands, Norway, and, and so on, that have um, sometimes reluctantly, but have repatriated some of the, the minors from the camps. Um, and in some cases, even the mothers, um, despite uh, the risk, but uh, perceiving uh, the, the females uh, in their role as a mother and not as a separate uh, entity, which is also uh, um, uh, problematic, but um, this is another question. And interestingly, uh, uh, countries like Kazakhstan, for example, has repatriated 700 people, uh, which is, I think, unprecedented. Uh, 520 children, the rest mostly women, but also 25 um, men, but has refrained from really uh, prosecuting the women, which is also, again, problematic, but um, more to it. And I think, um, again, this has been mentioned, the longer that we leave people in these camps, the more they will also adopt uh, a discourse of victimization. Um, they will um, perceive themselves as the sole victims um, and they will perceive uh, both uh, the Kurdish administration but also the West as the enemies. And any kind of um, hope that there was that, that they might be, you know, be disillusioned of IS, that they might you know, disengage, for example, or even de-radicalize, this chance is shrinking by the hour. Um, and again, also because now uh, Save the Children has put out a report that 60 kids have died just this year uh, in the camps. Um, so again, we are, we're losing time. And, and I really uh, think uh, this, this was a great uh, uh, way to frame it. It's a, it's a threat multiplier, the, the, the current situation and the, the reluctance of, of 
um, of yeah, Western governments mostly to, to repatriate the citizens, um, as Ambassador Fitton Brown has, has put it. Um, and then still, we, we really um, have difficulty prosecuting women. Um, this is not only due to a lack of evidence, because women traditionally had uh, you know, different roles with the Islamic State. Um, they appeared less often in, in propaganda videos, for example. If they appeared, they were revealed, of course. Um, and um, also because um, in some cases, uh, courts are having still, or also security agency in, in that matter, have a biased gender assumption saying that women have been passive, they have been victims, they are not really responsible. And for example, we cannot really separate them from their children because they will suffer. And I think this is really something still problematic, uh, how, we, um, how we see women not only in the, in the role of, of mother of, of, of children with the Islamic State, but also in their own capacity and in their own decision making. And for example, Germany, I would say, has been quite successful in at least using, for example, international law to still prosecute for looting, uh, uh, for crimes against humanity, um, but still uh, uh, prosecuting for genocide is still something that we need to really work on, on more uh, because this is a crucial issue, I think, and um, the, the Yazidi community in that sense also needs to um, see that justice done. Um, practitioners um, have reported they are also fearing fierce compliance. Uh, so returnees pre pretending they're disengaged, pretending they're de-radicalized, but not at all, um, especially um, women that uh, will, you know, try to show, show uh, compliance for fear of having their children removed. So I think this is also an issue for, for risk assessment. Um, and finally, all the other difficulties that come along with the integration to, into society, mental health issues, uh, many of them are really severely traumatized, um, and also the social stigma of being a returnee uh, of, of having been with IS um, in many countries is still a, is still a huge problem. Um, so uh, finally, I would like to point out three things. So first, um, I have touched a bit about this, but, this, but um, I want to stress that we know much more about the different profiles of foreign fighters. Why would they join a jihadist terrorization uh, um, organization? Uh, how would they travel? What are their roles why, while they're with these organizations? But also, and what kind of uh, human resource policy jihadist organiza organizations can adopt that make jihadists also uh, uh, join another group because they feel that they don't you know, have the right role, they could be doing better, and what they uh, hoped uh, to achieve with this group, um, they're not getting. So also the, the hopping between different, different factions as we have seen in, in Syrian Iraq. Um, and also we know that simple life events like having a baby uh, can really change also a person and, and, and uh, present this kind of window of opportunity uh, and, and, and create a, a cognitive opening where people say, well, this is what I'm doing with my life. Uh, I'm not sure I want to do this. And then this kind of opening can also be a, a motivation to, to go back um, and uh, retreat from the, from the group. Um, but still, um, it's really difficult to say. I would also be very cautious in you know, making any estimates um, because, uh, we also have less, uh, less access to social media, um, which was very useful in analyzing Islamic State. Um, and, and we have um, obviously a lack of intelligence if our embassies in Afghanistan are still closed. And it's much more difficult to really get a, get a you know, understanding of what's going on uh, on the ground. Um, the second point, uh, again, do not underestimate the role of women. Um, some aspects I already mentioned. And what I would also like to stress is that, for example, there are reports that uh, you know, those women that come back from, for example, to Central Asian countries are now involved in fundraising, they're very active, they're supporting brothers in other countries, um, so they're becoming really, really important, uh, um, uh, yeah, elements of, of the whole networks, and for example, in, in Germany, we know that as many of them, uh, of the male foreign fighters are, jail, are in jail, uh, the, the, gender, the gender roles are changing, so for example, the former uh, in, before uh, an online chat, for example, was strictly only for men. Um, now they're opening up to women. Um, so there's a really change of um, women being um, possibly more important. Um, and I think it's, it's really worth to watch this kind of development, um, not, not necessarily in the, in the traveling, but in the fundraising, the recruiting and the propaganda part and the facilitating networking part and so on, because this can be really something that um, we, we, we could un underestimate. Um, and finally, we know from, from analysis on, on foreign fighters is that 
the social environment, so uh, parents, friends, teachers, and so on, um, are so important in all the aspects because they can really be, uh, you know, spotting radicalization factors. Uh, they can be detecting plans to travel. In many, many cases, there has been some kind of illusion that, you know, I say goodbye because I will be traveling. So um, there is uh, now much more sensibilization uh, of what, you know, are the factors that might, you know, say this person might be traveling very soon and, and why and where. Um, but also um, we know that many times people are still in contact with some of their friends or some of the family members while abroad and that if they come back, um, the social environment is really one of the most stabilizing factors um, that we really should use in any kind of rehabilitation and reintegration efforts. Uh, they can be destabilizing, of course, um, if they uh, contributed to the, to the radicalization, but I think they can be really used in a in a in a constructive method to to at least reintegrate uh, once the person is uh, is back. Okay, um, this is from my side. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any question you might have.